Hello, Art Family. Most people that know of my work know of me through either painting alone or my children's books and young adult illustration alone. I get a lot of questions about my process and materials that I use for making panels and pages and comics and young adult books. So I thought I'd do a little video about the process. For the past few years, I've been working pretty much exclusively in watercolor and gouache, in comics and middle grade or young adult books. In fact, I wanted to talk a little bit about my book that's coming out in a month on August 25th. My first full-length graphic novel is going to be released through Top Shelf. It's a 176-page middle grade graphic novel done entirely in watercolor and gouache. The goal of my illustration is to combine the lessons of traditional painting from the 19th century with modern storytelling ideas to try to convey an atmosphere and a world that's believable and really draws you in. I wrote the story Cody because I wanted to make a story about finding a place where you belong and feeling like you belong somewhere. To put it simply, it's a story about a girl and her best friend who are separated and their journey to come back together again. So now to talk a little bit about process. I always start by penciling the page. I typically will arrange a full comics page on 10 by 14 or 11 by 17. I draw all the big major shapes and surface lines holding the pencil in reverse grip so that I draw with my elbow more than my hand. Then I switch to holding it regular style so that I can detail in things and figure out the placement of you know eyes and noses and that sort of thing. I try to focus on the full swing though of my arm when I draw because I feel like it gives more life and uh, animation to the characters in a scene. It also helps me to focus on the bigger shapes and not get too caught up in trying to draw a perfect face. If you, you can get caught up in drawing a perfect face and then have a terrible rest of the panel. So it's good to focus on the big shapes first. Once I'm happy with the pencils, I'll often roll over the page with a kneaded eraser kind of rolled into a, a cylinder just to knock off some of the pencil, and then I'll pre-wet most of the background. A lot of times I don't draw backgrounds for my panels. I will usually put in a couple lines to indicate form, but I try not to focus on drawing too much in the background because there's a tendency to draw too much or overdraw in the background and so I like to sort of think of the big shapes in the background um, even if it's a city scene or a forest scene and then focus on the way light hits objects and think of them as simple shapes and sort of allow the form to be built by applying the laws of light to those objects or those forms. I'll start an initial wash with the lightest values, working my way down and building a sort of sky, typically moving from cool blue to a warm yellow ochre towards the base of the sky. Then I'll allow some other variations of color, depending on the scene. This is grass here that they're sitting on, so I'm using a vibrant green here. I'll always try to subdue the background though and keep the foreground more saturated in color. So I try to allow the background to lose saturation and lose importance so it pushes further back into the scene. In this case, it's green grass and light from the sun will hit the grass and bounce back up into the characters. So I try to focus on placing those downward facing planes or those lower facing planes to give them some color, usually yellow ochre or in this case some green, because I'm trying to catch that light that's hitting the ground and bouncing back up into the character. I'll also use some very light blue on the upward facing planes to catch some of those cool tones from the atmosphere. That's the light that fills in the shadows. When I place a big area of color, like I'm doing now with the blues, so I'm trying to pick up that atmospheric light from the blue sky that's filling in the shadows and causing them all to be cool on the outward facing areas, the furthest away. 
I'm going to try to warm it up when it gets closer to an object like the bear and this lower part of the basket by adding yellow ochre or raw sienna. But in the large area, the large field of blue, I will add its complement. I'll always reach for the complement. So if I've got a yellow area, I'll reach for a purple. If I have red, I'll reach for a green or green, I'll reach for a red. And in this case, I have this large blue area. So to break it up, I will reach for that orange of a similar value and place it directly in it just to catch that luminescent feeling of light. You also can sort of give the illusion of real light in a scene because people have a tendency to see the opposite color when they're looking at a field of a color. If you stare at a color and look away, you will often see the opposite color for a flash. So you can give people a sort of a luminescent trick, kind of like a magic trick by applying the complement of a color directly next to that color. It creates a sort of optical gray that has harmony. I'm placing in the distant trees by using raw sienna and ultramarine blue with some burnt sienna. So that's that orange, orangish red color placed next to some greens that helps reduce that saturation. The goal is to knock the saturation down so that it pushes it further back in the atmosphere. I then cool the color down as it gets lower. It helps to give a sort of misty feeling to a scene, especially in a scene uh, or a cartoon scene. You can get a nice sort of uh, whimsical feeling to it if you cool down the lower parts of the distance so you get a sort of kind of foggy, misty feeling. I'm placing in the tree using raw sienna and Payne's gray. You can use any variety of color. The goal is to just have a sort of warm neutral. And while that distant, those distant trees uh, and foliage are still soft and sort of fairly wet, before they dry completely, I'm gonna start placing in just some pieces and nudges of the trees so that it'll give the illusion that the trees are falling back into space and that the foliage is overlapping the trees. I also placed more vibrant colors, more warm colors, which is to say yellows and oranges in the lower facing planes of the main character, Katya is her name, of her jacket, just to try to catch more of the feeling that light is bouncing off of that blanket and hitting the lower facing planes. Her hair is the highest saturation that I could go for using cadmium yellow light. I did that intentionally because I wanted to draw the most focus to her by having the starkest complementary relationship on my main character. You'll see later on that I paint her jacket purple. That was an intentional decision. So that her, everywhere she is in a scene, regardless of the colors of the whole scene, she stands out because she's bright yellow and bright purple. She also often stands against this yellowish bear who is pitched more yellowish because her jacket is purple. And so I'm trying to push that relationship, that complementary relationship of color. I tried to fill in the back half of the bear with a cool blue using some cobalt blue and a lot of water to try to keep it light. Just to try to catch that atmospheric light of light that's just from the fill light of the atmosphere of the sky. So the blue light in the sky, much weaker than the sunlight, is going to fill up the shadow side. For flesh tones, I use most the same combinations on everybody, regardless of race. I use yellow ochre or raw sienna, cadmium red or carmine, that's a warm red or a cool red. And then I'll often use cobalt blue or ultra ultramarine. So essentially the flesh tone is orange that's been reduced in saturation using the complement of blue. If the person has darker colored skin, I just use more blue. I work my way down the face of anyone I'm painting using the classic zones in portraiture, which is to say more yellow ochre towards the top planes of the face, the forehead, more reds towards the middle planes of the face, and more cooler colors towards the bottom or neutral grays that appear to be cool because they're set next to very warm colors. 
I'll oftentimes push the redness in the ears and in the face and in the hands or the legs because it helps to give a certain sort of life to the characters. Even if it pushes it a little past reality, it helps to give the real sense that there's blood and real human life, luminescence to the character. The goal being to catch the subsurface scatter that happens in flesh. As light hits skin, it's treated differently than on a jacket, for example. Light will travel into the skin and create a sort of glow. If you think of like a candle that the wick has gone down into the candle and you get that sort of luminescent glow. I like to try to capture that same sort of luminescence in the flesh tone of characters in a different manner than I would a jacket, for example, that's going to be more matte surface. When I'm working on a comics panel, this is my main approach. I try to focus on the large shapes. Once I get those big shapes in, I'll start to subdivide into the smaller shapes before I begin the process of inking. I reserve ink only for the objects of most importance. The goal being to direct the focus of the viewer to a specific area and allow the rest of the information to sort of fall away into the distance. If this was a comics panel, it would just be one small panel or a large area of the page. If I have inset panels, I'll use masking tape or artist tape to tape off the area so that I can paint directly over it and then peel that off and paint the new panels. Painting comics takes a very long time and it's very tedious. So you kind of have to develop a process in order to keep up with deadlines. For me, that process typically involves having four or five pages going at once. I sort of create a circle on my desk. I can have about two or three on my actual desk. I have a French easel set up next to me. Typically, I'll have two pages on that, and then I'll have another page in waiting. And then as the process goes, depending on the page, I usually work on these large shapes of color across the whole page of each page, going from one, two, three, four, five then back to one, two, three, four, five, washing over the big areas, focusing on the large shapes, and then subdividing into the small areas before I move into inking. As I move into the shadow, I'm thinking again of those cool atmospheric lights that will illuminate the shadow. So I'm using cobalt blue and maybe some ultramarine and much less water at this point. As I go, each layer that I add, I use a little bit less water. I'm trying to go for the cast shadows first, just to anchor the drawing down, which is to say, to put the characters in the space. One of the next things I often like to do is add tree shadows or cast shadows from buildings or other people or other objects nearby, cast over the scene. This is very important and something often overlooked by beginners in comics or in illustration. This kind of thing is extremely helpful because you give the viewer the sense that this scene is bigger than just what's inside this picture. Maybe there's a large tree nearby or something that's casting a shadow across the scene. It gives people the sense that this scene is much bigger than it actually is. For inking, I use a Pentel pocket brush, and that's it. I just use this same pen over and over again for just about everything, the whole way through. I try to get a variation and a rhythm to my line, pulling it so that I can get thicker areas on the lower regions, thinner areas, and some variation in between the two. Oftentimes it will split on me and I have to have a page nearby that I just roll the pen on to try to keep the point sharp. For the tools, for watercolor, I use Daniel Smith watercolor pretty much exclusively, a couple Holbein colors. I use Arches 140 pound cold press paper and I like to use Faber-Castell 9000 pencils because they have clay in them so that it's a very soft pencil. This is a Pentel pocket brush. Sometimes I will use a carbon pen from JetPens, which is a waterproof pen. 
I use a wide variety of brushes, from mop brushes usually for the initial washes, either synthetic or real, and then mostly synthetic brushes from Escoda, the Prado and the Perla, mostly. Oh, and always, if it's a scene in the forest, I love to add god rays to the scene because it ha adds a lot of sort of drama to the scene and it focuses the light on the main characters. So that's it for my process on how I make comics. Um, if you're interested in, in my book coming out, there's a bunch of pre-order information I'll add in the description. And uh, it comes out August 25th, and I really appreciate everyone who's already said kind words about it. I'm so excited about the release, and I'm excited for you to read the story. Uh, the trailer is also available on YouTube. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. In the meantime, happy sketching.